Welcome to an all new Sunday Morning View Q. Today, I'm going to answer your questions about my full time RV life, including should old ladies be traveling on their own? How do nomads get their mail? And then how do they vote if they vote by mail? I need to correct something that I said last View Q, and I'm going to answer a question about how you can get your family on board with you if you want to be a nomad. Happy Sunday, everybody. I hope you're all doing well out there. Thanks for stopping by to see a new view queue. The first thing I want to say today is thank you to all of the subscribers that just pushed me up over 125,000. And I want to say congratulations to all the people that wrote in the last view queue that they were about to hit the road. I'm happy for all of you. Please let me know how it goes. I'm psyched that your journey is about to begin. Okay, I have a bunch of good questions and I'm going to answer them now. Rebecca Kennedy said, Hi Robin, I'm looking to buy a Grand Design travel trailer with the theater sitting. Is that what you have? Is it comfortable? Is it durable? Would you recommend it? Okay, yes, I do have the Grand Design reclining theater seats. I think they call them theater seats. They are wicked comfortable. I love them. But I will tell you there is one really funny thing about these chairs. The one closest to this side is bolted to the ground but the other one is not bolted to the ground. It is connected to the one that is by like this weird hook. And it's really hard to get the hook in there and it comes out all the time. So I didn't know this. And one time I was in here chilling and I was extended, you know, the legs were out. I think the cat knocked over a drink or something like that. So I lunged forward and girl, I completely got flipped out of the chair onto the ground. Like literally the chair flew over on top of me. And um, it's actually unhooked right now again. So that's not great for travel because they can shimmy around a little bit. I need help to get it rehooked. It's not the kind of thing that you can do by yourself, but hopefully Doug's going to help me when he visits here in a little bit and I can get it redone. But for comfort, they're great. Okay, time for a little correction corner here from my video from last time. DPL says, hi, sorry your rig got nailed. You would think professional truck drivers are good drivers, not so much. I was a police officer for 35 years in the Northeast. Covered many, many parking lot incidents with trucks. And yes, we would investigate a hit and run in private parking lots. It depends on the department, so always call. I agree with the guy. I think it's always good to call on all things, right? I think the most common thing is that the police don't come out to private parking lots, but I know that there are exceptions to that in the different departments across the country. So thanks DPL for keeping me honest on that one. I think it's Dana Lynn Grice. Forgive me if that's wrong. Question. Do you have any fear of heights when driving RV pulling trailer on mountain roads with steep drop off sharp turns or high bridges? If so, have you ever had to turn around? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> I do have a fear of heights and I do not like driving when there's like that drop off next to you, you know, that doesn't have a rail and goes to nowhere. The more that I've driven, the less it affects me. There is a great road that goes over the top of Rocky Mountain National Park. It takes you from Estes Park to um, Lake Granby. It's so high that there's not enough oxygen for the trees to grow. And I was looking at the map and there's probably 10 or 11 really hairy switchbacks. And a lady at the visitor center said, well, there are times when the front of your vehicle looks like it's over nothing as you turn. It's just a drop, but you just have to trust that the road will be there. And I said, I remember doing it once in my 20s and I was hella freaked out. I said, well, are there guardrails? And he said, well, sometimes. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, there are stone rails. And I said, oh, that's cool. And he said, but to be honest, you know, sometimes there's no rails. And I thought he was going to say, because that's where it wasn't needed because it wasn't a big drop off or something. And he said, because the road is so narrow that the stone wall wouldn't fit and it's a drop off. So I don't know, you guys, I'm going to head up that way and see how it goes. I just looked at a map and I think I'm about two miles from the start of the incline 
on Trail Ridge Road, which goes up over the top of Rocky Mountain National Park. I know I wussed out. I know I did. I mean, there are other things I want to see, so I'm going to go ahead and go with that is my reason. Okay, I kind of have a two-part question here. Debbie Carter said, how do you get your mail forwarded, and how do you know where you will be and where to have it sent? Okay, so if you go back in my playlist, Be a Nomad, Change Your Life, I actually have videos on this, and also in the book, Be a Nomad, Change Your Life, I have a whole chapter for how to get packages and mail with links to those places. But some of the big ones are My RV Mail Service, Escapees has a great service, Good Sam. There are lots of places like that that will give you a permanent address if you need one. But you have to be careful. So let's say you go through Escapees and their permanent address for you is in Texas. Then you have your health care in Texas, let's say, and you get sick. Maybe you don't want to convalesce in Texas. These are things you have to take into consideration when you're choosing where your permanent address is going to be. In my case, for a while, I actually had a UPS store that had a mailbox for me and they forwarded my mail to any other UPS store. So I paid for the box, which I think was 30 bucks a month. And then I could call them on the phone and ask them to go through the mail and anything that I wanted them to send to me, I could pay $5, I think, to have it sent to another UPS store. So I just had to be near another UPS store. Other services like Good Sam and Escapees do offer upgraded services where they will scan your mail and put it into an inbox for you. So you can always have access without actually having to get the mail physically. So don't just necessarily choose a state because it's in the middle of your route, for example, or because you can get a ballot there by mail. Okay, I know in my opening, I said, should old ladies be RVing by themselves? And I know that was kind of a, uh, to uh, me and everybody else around my age that RVs are older by themselves. And uh, Linda May said, Robin, I would like to know your take on an older single female RVing. I think it's totally fine. <laughs> you know, I would encourage you to check out the group RVing Women. I interviewed them a while ago in a video, but this is a group of women all over the country, nonprofit, that have been RVing solo for decades, since the 70s. Now when I say solo, some of them do have partners, but the group itself is for women. So they get together um, in groups in their region, but once you're a member, you can drop into any group of the country so you can make friends. And they have a lot of resources on how to RV safely. And look, statistically, if we're out camping, we're less likely to run into the most common types of crime. But we are also less likely to get an ambulance in a small amount of time. So we each have to take our own safety and our own health and, into consideration. Um, I like to go pretty far out. So because that's my style, you know, I have an emergency beacon that looks like this. Um, this is on my gear page, by the way. There's one link to this if you need something like this. I chose this one. I think it was $300. It was a pricey purchase for me. But let's say I have a stroke. I know that I can hit the button and help is going to come my way, even if I can't drive out. It's going to be slower. But at least I'll have a way to get some help to me. I also have a lot of safety gear around my rig. I've done videos on that before, and I will do another one coming up soon. You know, one time I wrote a blog post called The Fear, Fantasy, and Reality of RV Life. It was something like that. And basically I said, some people have an unrealistic fear of RV life because they think everywhere you go, it's drug addicts and pedophiles and, you know, slashers and men, you know, with a hook in your door. And that's not reality. But then there's another group of people that think, you know, it's just a hippie commune and everybody's going to help everybody and everybody's going to be honest and be your friend. That's not true either. The community of RVers that's out there is just like any other community. And the reality is that you're going to still be you and have the same concerns you do now just on the road. So, for example, if you go to a boondocking spot and you see bullets or graffiti or, you know, furniture laying out there or just some other person out there, you know, gives you the heebs, I would leave. 
Um, if you saw my video from last time, you know that you can find a lot of other options. I did not know that in the beginning. And I'll tell you a funny story since I brought that up. I was hell-bent on finding this boondocking spot that I found on freecampsites.net like my third month out. The road was heinous. It was a terrible spot. I couldn't get level. I went nose in, so I didn't have a good escape, which was against my rules. But it had a good Wi-Fi signal. Now, in retrospect, in that area, now I know 10 other places that I should have kept researching, but I used one app with that one spot, which is a mistake. So, I may have told this story like a year ago, but I finally got in my spot. I went outside with a glass of wine in my hand, in my pajamas, in my slippers, and I was talking to Doug on the phone. And there was a giant boulder next to my rig. And I looked down and I saw a giant cat paw. It was this big. And it was on the ground on the other side of the boulder. And I started whispering, oh my God, oh my God. And I'm backing up and Doug is going, what, what, what? And I was like, please don't move, please don't move. And I went into the house and my heart was thumping. And you know, I had nothing then. I was not the Home Alone 2.0 girl I am now, where I have a lot of stuff in here that would hurt somebody. I have stuff outside. I have stuff to protect myself. Then I had absolutely nothing. So about half an hour later, I got up the nerve to go back outside, and I tiptoed around this boulder, and it was a giant dead mountain lion. I don't know what killed it, but I'll tell you after that, I found hooves of all varieties, just parts of animals, like 15 of them all over the place. Later, a ranger told me she thought it was a dumping ground. But that was the day that I went, oh, <laughs> I kind of have to make sure that I'm okay out here. And so I adjusted after that. Now I have stuff to protect me. Now I have gear to call out if I need to. I know I have backup spots. If I get into like pet cemetery again, I could go to a different spot. I would also say that anybody old, young, male, female, whatever. I know a lot of people that feel better traveling with a group. And you can be as solitary or social as you want to be on the road. It's all up to you. I know huge groups of people that travel together because it makes them feel safer. Of course, we all know there's 50 and then there's 50. And there's 75 and then there's 75, right? Everybody's going to be different as they get older. And I think you just have to take yourself and think about what you can do and what you can't do and have a good safety protocol. We all need a good safety protocol when we're out there. That's all. Just like anybody else, you're just like anybody else. So I think it's totally fine. You do it. Do you? And if you need to find some friends to do it with, check out RVing Women. There are also some other groups through Facebook and also through escapees that you can join. Maybe in the beginning, you know, you join a caravan and go out with some other people until you get your legs under you and you feel like um, you're just fine to be out by yourself. Okay, and finally, my favorite one. My Heart Wants to Wonder said, that's so cool you went boondocking with your mom. We are about the same age and my mom does not want me to hit the road. She thinks it's dangerous. Was your mom always supportive? What did she think of the camping? I wish my mom would do that with me. Okay, My Heart Wants to Wonder. I loved that my mom went camping with me and I was completely surprised that she wanted to. When I first said I was going to hit the road, first you have to understand that we weren't campers. I had never been in an RV. So my mom was like, aliens? What did the aliens do with my daughter and who are you? I explained to her the rationale. Of course, she was worried I was leaving a corporate job and going out on my own. It wasn't a dangerous. So I asked her to start watching some other videos. She actually became a really big fan of Pippi Peterson. And every time I talked about anything, even to this day, she goes, well, Pippi says, <laughs> Pippi says, and I'm like, yeah, she's great. It took my mom some time to get on board. I think she had to see, <laughs> yes, I know, I'm not petting you. I think she had to see that it was working and that I was really gonna stick to it because I think most of the people in my life thought I was gonna do it for three months ago, oh no. That was a terrible mistake and stop. And instead, I just liked it more and more. And, you know, the more I stayed in touch with her and showed her the pictures and started the YouTube channel, the more on board she got. I really had to show her by example that this was okay for me. And as far as the camping goes, I never 
thought she would do that. And I took her to a place that I knew. We went down the dirt roads and I had a morning fire with her. And I'm going to tell you, she did not want to do the morning fire at all. She didn't get it. I was like, come on, mom, you got to experience the whole thing, right? The birds were singing. The moss was drying off the plants. We had a great talk. And the next morning, I look outside and my mother is running around the campsite, picking up twigs to try and get some kindling for the fire. Anyway, by the time I was able to get my shoes on, she was out there with our coffee and leaning back and the fire was going and she looked 10 years old. She just couldn't believe how much she liked the fire. And we had a really great time. So I'll look back on that for the rest of my life and, and be really grateful that we had that time and we did that because it helped my mother understand my life more than she would have had she not gone. Thank you for all the great questions. And if you have a question for me for the next view queue, please do leave it down below. And I hope you're all doing well out there and doing something that you love. Until I see you next time, have happy travels and be free.